working with uh, Unix for over 25 years. Try this. I've been working with FreeBSD for more than 15 years, since the early days. And besides all the products I, uh, projects I do, uh, I also often wear the sys admin hat. And currently I administer about 100 FreeBSD boxes and I don't know how many virtual machines on that. So I'm always looking into how to do things easier and uh, try to get rid of all the repetitious work. Um, small disclaimer is in place here. Uh, this is not the only and best way to do things that I'm presenting here. It's just uh, the way I found out after experimenting for many years uh, which works well for me. Um, give this an example to you and please feel free to use it as well or in part as you like. So, as a sysadmin, you have to make a decision. What do you do with your servers? You can upgrade your software on a regular basis. That gives you bugs fixed, that gives you security fixes, new features. It also gives you some new bugs. And it gives you downtime every time you want to upgrade your system and one thing your customers won't like or your users won't like is downtime. Or you can decide to just install your system once and well, as soon as it runs and everything functions, don't touch it anymore. Well, it's uh, easy, you don't have to do much to the system anymore, you will have not much downtime unless something breaks. But you get no fixes, uh, have a lot of security risks. Um, if eventually after a couple of years you have to move to new hardware, it usually means you have to start all over because in the meantime your operating system has kept two major releases, uh, all your applications have moved to newer versions and uh, things have changed. You have to rethink everything, how did I once build that system? And, uh, well, you just have to start over. Uh, I also found out that with existing systems, if after some time uh, your users ask for another application to be added, if in the meantime you have not upgraded your system, you'll find out that your new application needs a library that is already installed, but it needs a much newer version. And you can't just install a newer version of that library because other applications depend on it as well. Uh, I've done this for a while with certain systems that were not connected to the outside world and uh, considered safe, but um, I found out it's uh, a pain in the neck in the end if you want to either add applications or you have to rebuild your system. So this talk is all about the choice of upgrading your software on a regular basis. Um, keep in pace with development and so it's sometimes a difficult task especially when you have like hundreds of ports installed on your FreeBSD machine and one way we computer people tend to uh, attack difficult jobs is by splitting up into smaller pieces and attack every piece in turn. So this means uh, instead of having one server with numerous applications, <coughs> we split it up in separate servers or virtual servers, uh, ideally one per application or sometimes a few applications uh, on one server. Um, the next thing to make your job easier is find a way that you can prepare everything offline. And um, once it's ready and tested, you only need a short service window uh, to install what you have changed and upgraded uh, onto your production machine. But what if 
will encounter unexpected problems after you've done the upgrade. Well, traditional way of handling this is either you deinstall the software and install the older versions, but that means uh, long downtime for your users. You go back to your backups, but even backup stakes, uh, backup, uh, backup stake time. Uh, so what you want is an easy rollback system. Roll back to where you started from, your known good situation, and then fix the problems offline, and we try later. Okay, one application per server or virtual server. You can use multiple, machine, multiple machines for your applications. That's the easiest way uh, if you look at your administration tasks. Uh, every machine is just a separate machine. You just build it the way you've always built your machines and you just have one or two applications on it. But it's expensive to have many machines around. They use a lot of power. They generate a, a lot of heat. And they use a lot of space. And Space is becoming expensive, power is expensive, and heat needs a lot of air conditioning, and that's expensive too. So this is expensive four times. You can go to virtual servers, and nowadays VMware, Xen, VirtualBox, and even some people use Spells. There are popular ways to virtualize your applications. Um, it's flexible. On one machine, you just instantiate another virtual machine, and there you go with a new machine for your new application. It's a lot cheaper than having multiple physical machines. It uses less power than all the physical machines and generates less heat. But all these technologies, they emulate either the hardware or something just above the hardware. And on top of that, you put another kernel, and uh, that costs you a lot of performance, depending on your hardware, depending on uh, which virtualization technology you use. You can lose up to maybe 25 to 50 percent of the performance of your machine. And you also have to maintain this virtualization software. Uh, also, VMware, Xen, and so on, come with new versions on a regular basis. And you have to replace it underneath all your virtual machines. And then there is the cost of licenses for the commercial ones in this list. Um, I'm now talking to a group of BST people. Um, well, in the B, oh sorry, sometimes BSD is not or not fully supported, like with Xen. Uh, it's very much geared towards Linux. Um, uh, I know some people like Kip Macy are working on uh, free BSD support for uh, Xen, but it's not mature yet. What else do we have? Well, in FreeBSD we have got jails. Uh, jails, first of all, are very lightweight. Whether you put an application inside a jail or not makes no measurable difference in the performance. It's very well integrated in FreeBSD itself. We'll see it later. Uh, you'll get some extra security edits. We'll see it later too. On the downside, it's FreeBSD only. So if your application needs to run another operating system, don't use my talk. But I'm a FreeBSD guy, and of the 100 plus Unix machines I administer, uh, less than five are not FreeBSD. You're in a single kernel. That's not a limitation, so you can't have one application that really needs uh, the newest uh, eight stable kernel, for instance, and another application that will not work beyond six or seven. So that's not a limitation. Um, some applications need special care if you put them inside a jail. Uh, I've had issues with Samba, 
and uh, I've heard someone uh, have to dig into that. So one of my customers has a problem with an, a music server running inside a jail. But these are usually issues that can be easily overcome once you understand what's going on. But uh, so far, most of the applications are for and uh, behave very well inside jails. Another negative point, made, well, another challenge here is that uh, having multiple jails, uh, you prefer we also have separate file systems per jail. And having a lot of file systems uh, was kind of a challenge, especially until about well, two years ago. Uh, we had uh, the MBR uh, slices, uh, BSD label, they only supported like four slices and seven partitions per slice. Uh, also needed to statically allocate space to each slice and it was not easy to grow. You have to move stuff around, which is not a lot of downtime for your system. So two years ago, Mr. Paul Baudek at uh, Poland came to the rescue and he ported ZFS over from OpenSolaris to FreeBSD. ZFS easily manages numerous file systems, no problem. And it has a flexible quota system. In fact, all the ZFS file systems share the same free space. You don't have to allocate uh, 5 gigs to this file system and 10 to the other. Uh, all the free space is on one heap and all the file systems take from this free space. To make sure an application is not abusing all the free space, you put quota on every file system and if your file system has a quota of let's say 5 gigabytes and you find out well we need a little bit more I want to up it to 7 it's one command and you up your quota from 5 to 7 gigabytes instantaneously and your application just keeps running um, negative side is it's not ideal on 32-bit hardware uh, it really prefers 64-bit address space here and lots of memory. Well, let's start with 4 gigs minimum. Um, it's rather young. Uh, I don't know exactly when it was introduced to Solaris. Uh, it came over to FreeBSD uh, two years ago. So um, it looks quite stable now, stable enough that I use it uh, for production with some of my customers already. But um, like with all new software, uh, there may still be issues uncovered. And then the big scary thing, uh, send being bought by Oracle, what will happen to the license in the future? Uh, most probably we'll be able to keep using what we have got so far, but there are some new uh, developments at CERN with uh, ZFS, some new features coming up that are quite promising and will be very nice if we can all use it. But at the moment it's really my my best choice if you want to put a lot of gels on a machine to uh, divide your disk space. Another very powerful feature of CFS is a very cheap snapshot. Uh, cheap in the sense that it takes a very short time to make a snapshot and it's very low overhead on your disk. And this, as we will see later, will allow us to prepare upgrades offline from the virtual machines that our users are running their applications in. They also allow us a very easy rollback if unexpected problems arise once we are running the new version of our software. So, with Cenevis and Chaos, we have covered the virtual machines. But underneath the virtual machines, we also need <coughs> the operating system to boot your server, the, the kernel, and some tools in user land. Um, 
hard to do and a lot of experimenting with all kinds of setups. I found nano BSD for me the perfect fit. Again, it's not a one size fits all situation, but for many of my servers it's a really good solution. Why? I can build the operating system image, either on this machine or somewhere, uh, somewhere else, doesn't matter. I can upgrade with a minimal downtime. In fact, the time needed for a boot is the only downtime we have. It uh, has a dual image model, and that means that there are, in fact, two copies of the whole operating system on your media. One is running at the moment, and uh, I can install my new version in the other one. This automatically gives you a very nice one-step rollback if your new version uh, exposes problems that you did not anticipate. You can run it from a flash drive. Um, I consider that a uh, good thing for at least one of my customers, he needed a machine which is uh, fully encrypted, which is remote like 200 kilometers from where he is. Um, I found it very convenient to just sign up a complete system, a complete minimal system from the flash drive, then have him uh, remotely enter the machine and type in his uh, secure passphrase and then start up everything else which is on your hard disks. But also my other machines are now uh, installing small flash cards and uh, start up from the flash cards. I've uh, written that it's, it's read only, that's important for flash because if you write often to flash it uh, wears quite rapidly. Uh, people say a thousand writes, maybe ten times as much or only a tenth, I don't know, but it wears. And that's something you don't want. You want your machine to, to just keep on running. Uh, the other thing is, because you don't write to it, uh, it remains the same all the time. And you know that after a reboot, you are in exactly the same starting position you were last time you rebooted. Um, it needs a little adjustment for the system administrator to get used to this with only situation on a minimal system. But um, I first used NanoBSD like five years ago on embedded systems. I got used to it. So I think most of you should be able to get used to it as well. So now we know our key players, our FreeBSD jails to lock in our applications to uh, separate them and uh, make it possible to upgrade one application environment at a time. CFS that uh, helps us managing all the file systems needed for all these deals. And then NanoBSD to boot the sys. <laughs> you can see it, it's so small. It, let me help you. There it is. <laughs> right. What is NanoBSD? Uh, in fact, NanoBSD is a shell script. It uh, comes with your BSD source tree, has been there for many years already. It was originally written by Paul Henning Camp. And it was written uh, with embedded systems in mind. Uh, you can't do a complete build world on an embedded system, except uh, when you're very patient. Um, um, what it does is it, uh, it generates an image file, which is the size of your flash disk, and you just copy it byte by byte to your flash disk or block by block to your flash disk, install the flash disk, and it runs. So it's intended for use with compact flash or with flash, but you can also put it on your hard disk. So all of my story still is valid if you decide not to install a flash disk, but put this part on your hard disk. You only have to do a little partitioning to make that work, but that's not too difficult to find out. Um, 
it's, as I said, uses two operating system slices. One is active, the other one is standby, and you can install your new version in the other one. Uh, reboot using the other one, and you get your new version of the operating system, or roll back by switching back to the previous one. And um, all the configuration files you've touched, like the etcrc.conf, your password file, and so on, they are copied to a separate third partition and is shared by the two images. To build it, well, it's a shell script that needs normally two configuration files. The first configuration file describes what I'm building. And as it says here, I'm building uh, an image which I call nano server. And I use a kernel file, nano server, which is the second configuration file. I tell uh, the script what the size of my flash disk is and the geometry information, which bootloader to use. Um, I call some customization functions. Uh, I tell the build world and install world which parts of the system to exclude. You can put in a little bit more uh, in there. Um, people have followed my NanoBSD tutorial last Thursday or last year have seen this all. It's, uh, it's very flexible. You can put quite a lot in it. Um, you need a kernel configuration file which is just a normal kernel configuration file. So no, nothing special there. These two files describe the whole build. Which also means that if I have to make a new version next year, I don't have to rethink what did I put into the system originally, as long as I keep these two files around. And I even have a little customization routine, which is up on my website, that uh, automatically copies these two files into the resulting image. So if you've got the image running on your machine, you've got your configuration files in there, in ETC Nano BSD. So this is what your flash disk looks like. Um, it's a 386 architecture master boot record in the first sector. Uh, the rest of the first logical track is uh, spoiled here, like with any PC-like hardware. Then there's two equally sized operating system images, or two slices for operating system images. There's a small directory that only contains those configuration files that you have changed from what was produced by the build world. And that obviously the also allows you to make a separate, uh, another fourth data partition. Um, you don't need that, uh, but you can do. If you decide to run from your hard disk, you can use uh, these three small slices at the beginning of your hard disk, and the fourth one becomes your uh, VDEV, your virtual device for your CFS file system. So what's that about the configuration files? Well, um, when NanoBSD boots, it mounts two memory disks, one on ETC and one on FAR. Um, because in FreeBSD the configuration files of the base system go in ETC, but the configuration files for all your installed ports are in user local ETC, they've just copied them to a directory called ETC local and made a sim link back to your user local ETC. So applications find their files where they expect to find them, but you maintain them from ETC. All this ETC stuff during build is then moved to a directory slash conf slash base slash ETC. And the same for everything which is under var is moved to conf base var. During boot, these two memory disks are created, they're empty. Then the contents of these two directories are moved over or copied over to these two. And then finally, whatever you have changed and put in CFG is overwritten in ETC. This is another very nice thing for the system administrator because you know what you have changed. Because what you have changed, you have copied to CFG. 
and everything that's not in CFG, like ETC protocols and ETC services and ETC ether, and all of these files in ETC, if you've not changed them and not copied them to CFG, then you use the standard, which means if you upgrade to your new version of the operating system, you don't have to look if something has changed, or usually you don't have to look in there. So after you change any file in the ETC, what you have to do is you mount CFG, which is normally not mounted. Uh, you copy your changes from ETC to CFG and you unmount it again. Or you use a little script which I've put on my website, the URL is in the back. And the CFT sync script that I've written does a thorough comparison of what's in ConfBase, ETC, and ETC. Make sure that the differences are copied to CFG and warns you if there's some redundant stuff in CFG which should not be there anymore. Perhaps you have once had a file and then removed it from ETC, it warns you to also remove it from CFG. So, to build a NanoBSD, you first create the two configuration files we have just seen. You go into this directory, user source tools, tools, NanoBSD, that's where it expects the files. I usually don't go there, I have them in a separate directory myself, but that's whatever you like. Then you run the nanobsd.sh script and you tell it minus C the configuration file nanoserver.conf. Yeah. The build server has to be the same version of BSD as your sources. Um, inside this uh, file, the nanoserver.conf, which we've just seen, you can uh, add a variable called nano underscore SRC, which is the directory name of uh, your source tree. And on my build server in my office, I've got I don't know how many source trees next to each other. I've got a file system which I call slash source for historic reasons. And it has SRC-7 for 7 stable and SRC-72 for 72, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, security branch. And SRC-8 for 8 stable and SRC-8.0 for the 8.0 security branch. So if I have a machine running in the field with, for instance, 7.2, and I want to upgrade it to 7 stable, I just change that one line in the configuration file, the nano source, change it from source slash SRC-7.2 uh, to SRC-7, and then I rebuild everything. But the build server itself, what version does it have? Um, at the moment, my build server is 8 stable, and it perfectly builds 7 as well. But maybe you can go the other way. Uh, you should be able to go the other way because you can upgrade from FreeBSD 7 to 8 by building the build rules on 7. Okay. Yeah. So it should work both ways. Yeah. Okay. Then you get a file which is a image of what's supposed to be on your flash. It's called underscore.disc.full. And you just use DD to copy it to your flash. And then you put your flash into your, well, NanoBSD was meant for an embedded system, you put it in the embedded system, or with the server we are talking about, you put it in your server. And you're ready to run. If you want to upgrade to a new version, you upgrade your source tree, or what I just explained, you just move the pointer from one source tree to another or you have to edit your configuration files for perhaps you didn't have inet6 included but you want to go for ip version 6 so you take out the without inet6 from your configuration file you rebuild using the same commands as here nothing changed and now on that target machine that's running nanobsd already you just choose any way like ssh to get your disk image file to standard output and pipe it to a little, uh, little shell script that comes with nanobsd which in this case updates it to the partition number two or slice to in uh, freebsd lingo 
and then you reboot, and that's all. Um, if you want to go back later on, I forgot to put it on the slide, but if you want to go back to your previous version, if you're not happy with the results, there's a command called boot 0 CFG, and boot 0 CFG minus S can change the active partition for the next boot. You change it, and you reboot, and it's back. Um, I go through this stuff very quickly, but everything is in my paper. And also my paper has a reference to my website where you can find some of these files uh, to start working on. Okay, about the jails. Our jails divide our machine in virtual servers. Not only really virtual operating systems, it's no hardware virtualization whatsoever, it's just a separation like CH Roots does. But it's also network isolation, and up to FreeBSD7, that means you can have uh, one IPv4 address uh, assigned to the jail. Everything inside the jail uh, must use that address, and everything that's coming in over the network with another address will not enter the jail. In FreeBSD8 and later, we can have multiple IP addresses, both version 4 and version 6. And they are now merging another technology into the GL system, which is called VImage, which uh, gives you a complete separate network stack if you want to. And there is a restriction to the powers of root inside the GL. Like inside the GL, root cannot mount file systems anymore. Root cannot change your firewall rules if you have any. Which I think is a good thing because uh, one system administrator, one group of system administrators is responsible for the machine itself, but you may have multiple administrators for your virtual machines. And you don't want to do something to a virtual machine that affects the other ones. It's also very well integrated into etcrc and rc.conf. Um, it uh, comes with a bunch of variables that you can put into rc.conf to completely specify the startup of your GL. And among other things, it can add your designed IP addresses when the GL is started and also remove them when it's stopped. Um, it's not in not part of this talk, but I use it to easily move a GL from one machine to another. I stop it. So I first make an online copy using uh, the CFS uh, send and receive features. Then I stop it on one machine where the IP address is taken off the interface. I start the GL immediately on the other machine. Uh, the IP address is added to the interface of the other machine. It's sent a fictitious ARP, so everyone knows about the new MAC address for this IP address, and users can start using the application immediately. It uh, mounts file systems on the fly when you start a GL if you want to. This is essential for my concept here. And it mounts, of course, when you stop a jail. And it has some hooks, which I needed. Uh, uh, I needed the pre-start and the pre-stop hooks to do a little magic uh, just after starting the jail and before starting the applications inside the jail. And another thing after stopping the applications just before tearing down the jail. We'll see that later. So we first built, and that's a thing that I've come to after a lot of experimentation, one geo which I call the prototype. And inside the prototype, I build up a complete FreeBSD user land. I don't need a kernel because we all run in the same kernel, but I need a complete user land here. I install all the desired ports, my own maintenance tools, and I could install my application here as well, um, or install it, we'll see that later. How this is done can be read in the paper, it's uh, too much for a one hour talk. Uh, but I built up the whole virtual machine as it would be for 
my application. And when it's ready, I ask CFS to make a snapshot of it. Then, per application that I want to run, I create another geo. Um, in this geo, the root and USR are a read-only mount of the snapshot I've just taken. So it's shared space, I have no multiple copies on the machine. The snapshot of the ETC of my prototype GL gets mounted on conf base ETC. You see the similarity with what's going on in NanoBSD. Then I mount a memory disk on ETC, I do that from the pre-start hook. And I copy the contents of conf base ETC onto ETC. And afterwards I copy the contents of CFT over what's in ETC. So again, everything that built world created for slash ETC is in conf base ETC and copied to my memory disk. And only the files that I have changed need to be copied to CFT. So if my next version of FreeBSD has another two or three new lines in ETC services, I don't have to bother about it if I've never touched services. I get them in conf-based ETC automatically because it's mounted from the new snapshot. But my password file and my rc.conf and my well, resolve.conf and what other files is in group and, and so on that I've changed, they are in CFG and they override. So I still need to manually check if my new version of FreeBSD has another system user added to the password file. But I always have this one around. And CFS, uh, CFS also gives you very easy access to the ETC snapshot of the previous version. So a diff can be made online. I don't have to go and find where is this old version, do I have a tape? It's all on the, on the machine. So this is very much like the way NanoBSD handles ETC. And that's on purpose, of course, because I want to keep it consistent and simple. Except that I cannot use the same script that NanoBSD uses. NanoBSD is mounting a memory file system from within NanoBSD, but as I just told you, inside the geo, I cannot mount anything anymore. And that's why I need this pre-start hook to do it just before I get into the geo. And the same when I stop it. Um, I'll see that later. Then I have slash home and, and other data file systems. They are just private to this particular geo. So I can have multiple virtual servers with different sets of users, with separate home partitions, uh, or I can have multiple instances of my favorite database. I've got one machine running with five instances of MySQL for that customer. And they all have their own FireDB MySQL file system, all separated from each other. So in this uh, talk, I'll, I'll refer to my production, my, my application GL as vhost1. So if you see the name, that's the application GL we're building here. So first I must make sure that the root, which includes USR and USR local, is always mounted. Well, that's easily done with ZFS, you can see that in the paper. ZFS always automatically mounts all the file systems on startup except when you tell it otherwise. And I tell ZFS that the other file systems need not to be automatically mounted like slash home. Why? Because if I want to upgrade from one version of my geo to the next version, I get a new root. And home is mounted under the root. And I cannot unmount and mount a new root if the home is still there. Well, you go into the geo quite easily. Of 
from the administration of your host operating system, you find out which jail uh, ID you need by the JLS uh, command. It lists all your jails. Here there's one jail running, number one. Uh, this is something like a process ID is to processors. Every time you start a new jail, it gets the next number. This is the IP address assigned to this jail. It's only one IPv4 address, but it could be many addresses or even none. Uh, the host name as seen inside the jail and the top level directory. I put all my jails under a top level directory which I call slash jail. I then jxec to jail number one and I start a pin in there or whatever shell is your favorite and you are inside the jail so that means you see only the file systems that are visible to the jail, everything under jail proto. And in there, you can build your FreeBSD. Again, how you get your source and everything is in the paper. But um, you can do a normal build world and install world. You can do a mer merge master or merge master minus I to update everything in ETC. Because this jail is not used for production, there are not many files in ETC that are changed from a plain install. In fact, what I change here is my rc.conf is uh, my etc resolve.conf because inside the jail I need network access so I need DNS. And I do things like my etc local time because I want all my jails to appear in the same time zone. Uh, if you want to run uh, wall CMOS clock, you can touch the wall CMOS clock file here. Um, I run all my machines w without NIS installed, so I have to change etc nswitch.conf and take NIS out, otherwise I get zillion uh, error lines in my log files. But that's about it. It's just a handful, like four or five files that have changed from start. And mostly because I want the same changes in all the jails, except for rc.conf. Or I can go to one of the ports directories and make an install and clean there to add more applications or use port upgrade or port master or which is your favorite to upgrade already installed ports. This can all be done inside this prototype jail and again when you reach the point where you're, you think you're happy and you can run, you snapshot this file system and then we are off, you'll see that. Yeah, ZFS minus R snapshot this proto with a new version, version N, which can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or whatever names you want. I prefer incremental numbers starting at 1. So to start up the geo, what goes in etcrc.conf is, well, the root there, here, the domain name, the IP address, I need only one. Uh, which interface to bind it to, I chose IGB0 to make uh, uh, GNN happy, he's not here, I guess, but, well. Um, I enable my dev file system, you really need that for applications. Uh, I said mount enable to yes, because I dynamically want to mount everything that's needed in the geo, and what's needed there is in the file etc add a step, but proto. By the way, this line I was uh, suggested by uh, Powell can be taken out because that's the default in FreeBSD. If you have mount enable is yes, it'll construct this name for you if you want. Uh, there are a lot of other options you can do like uh, uh, file descriptor file system or a proc file system or um, there are many other things you can do there. See the etc defaults rc.conf. And the Everstep Proto says, well, I already have my uh, root and etc mounted, but I also need a local slash var, and I need my source directory and my ports directory and some place for my object files. And then I have a file system slash freebsd on the outer, well, the host operating system in which I keep my local repository of uh, all the FreeBSD sources that I mirror every night using CSAP. Um, I mount this using NFS and not using NullFS. Um, I'm 
not 100% sure, but the last I've read is that Nullifest is good for read only, but has some issues with read write. I want the read write because I also put my uh, my cache of distribution files for the ports in here. Because well, in my office it's shared among a lot of machines using NFS. Well, so the application tools then they are started up. I mount a SIP tree of, uh, sorry, I mount a SIP tree under GLV host. This SIP tree, as we'll see in a moment, is a snapshot of my prototype tool. Uh, it includes the root user, user local, and so on. Then I mount conf, B, uh, conf base etc, which is also a read-only snapshot of etc. So I made it a separate file system under uh, the prototype jail, so I can mount it in a different place. I mount a private slash CFT, which is just a plain read-write file system. Then in a hook, a pre-start hook that I have written, I create this MD file system, it's initialized from of base etc, and then uh, the files in CFT copied over, mount the other file systems, and we are gone. On shutdown over jail, I have a hook in here that automatically calls this script we've seen for, uh, before with uh, NanoBSD. It's called here again to synchronize between uh, the conf base etc and etc and put the changes into CFG inside my geo. I didn't have, uh, have that at first. And well, some of my words were not in the dictionary when I found out that I too quickly tried to restart the geo and forgot to copy my files in etc. So now I've put it into the pre-stop hook and it synchronizes the files automatically. And then it mounts every other file system. So when I want to upgrade to a new snapshot, I modify the FSTEP file pointing at a new snapshot. We'll see the FSTEP file on the next slide. And I restart the jail. And that's all there is to it to get to a new version. So most of my production jails will take something between half a second and two seconds to restart. And then my, my users are welcome again. Hence my title, minimizing the service windows using this technique. If I want to roll back, if I'm not happy with my new uh, environment, it's easy, I just modify etc fvstop.vhost1 again, uh, lower the snapshot number back to what it was, and I restart it, and I'm back. So here are the, uh, the part of rc.conf pertaining to the vhost1 here, it's very similar, the root, the hostname, IP address, interface, and so on. Uh, the other step is similar, then there's two extra lines, the pre-start zero script and the pre-stop zero script point to two scripts I've written. Uh, I give an argument vhost1 to tell it which geo to work on, and this one, uh, the first one will do the trick with creating the memory disk, mounting it, um, copying over conf base etc, then override it with CFG. And the other one will first call CFG sync to sync all the changes from etc back to CFG and then uh, does the unmounting and destruction of my memory disk. And the fstep.v host, well here is the root directory of my vhost one zero, which is taken from snapshot number one, in this case, of my prototype. And the etc, well, conf base etc, is taken from a snapshot of the etc. And that means when upgrading I need to change this number one and this number one to the number of the snapshot I want to use. Or when rolling back, I can roll it back to the number one or whatever. And then there's the other file systems that are private to this deal, and I've given home as an example, but, yeah. Uh, why would you uh, want to reboot the jail? 
uh, I want to reboot my geo if I want to upgrade the application in the geo. Geo does run kernel, so you can shut down the application and you start the application. No, because my uh, root USR and USR local inside my Geo are read only. Okay, if, if your application is like uh, your own written application and it's not in USR but in slash APPL or whatever directory you choose, uh, to restart that one, you don't have to restart the jail. But if, for instance, I have upgraded my base system from eight to, uh, uh, well, from eight stable uh, of uh, last week to eight stable of this week, for whatever reason, a bug fix or whatever, then I want to do the same upgrades to the jails as well. But because I've split all my applications in separate jails, I don't necessarily have to do it to all the jails at the same time. I can schedule per jail when it's convenient to restart that one. But yes, if, you're, if the application you've written yourself is not part of the operating system, the, the user or the user local, then you can do that anytime you want uh, without restarting the jail. Uh, but for, um, I use a lot of FreeBSD ports. Um, for instance, I'm using one of my GLs with uh, other two customers that are running a Samba server. If I want a new version of Samba, I uh, upgrade in my prototype GL. And I also have a spare GL lying around which I just use as a test bed. So I first upgrade my prototype and snapshot. Then I move my testbed GL to the next snapshot version, the newest snapshot version. I use it for testing and when I'm happy, I do the same to the production GL that my users are in. That's also where you uh, adapt all these configuration files to the next release because that's one of the bigger problems when you have applications that upgrade themselves, they require different configuration files and you have to merge the old ones with the new ones. You, yeah. do, that, you do that in the test bed, right? Uh, that's a good point, Adrian. Uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, if you upgrade an application that needs major changes to your um, configuration files, uh, I'm about to do a upgrade of script 2 to script 3 for one of my customers, which has a completely new configuration file. I first use my test tool to test it, and uh, then I finally do the same to the production jail. Um, for the configurations in CFG, you can also make snapshots of CFG very easily with ZFS, uh, CFS and then roll back if for whatever reason you have to go back from script 3 to script 2 for instance. So the big picture is we have a flash disk and a hard disk. NanoBSD occupies my flash disk is enough to boot up the system and gives me enough tools to manage my ZFS file systems and to um, start up all the jails. On the hard disk with ZFS, there is slash FreeBSD and a source and, uh, and an object directory which I use to build my NanoBSD. I cannot build NanoBSD inside the geo for the very same reason I told you before. Inside the NanoBSD script, it needs to mount something. And mounting is not allowed inside the geo. So that's why I built NanoBSD outside the geo. For some customers, for other customers, I build them on my product, no, on my build server in my office and then transfer the image to the customer. Then there is an almost empty directory slash geo that only contains the mount points for all my geos. Here's my prototype geo, where this part is the read-only snapshot I've mounted. Uh, we, uh, so you know, this is the, uh, the route that I take the snaps uh, snapshots of. The ETC that I take snapshots of. Far is private to Proto. Then my user source, user ports, OBG are uh, also private. My FreeBSD is an NFS mount. On some machines I need some extra here. But you get the ID. Then I built my first production jail, which I call VHost1, which is a snapshot 
this one is a snapshot of this one. I get a memory disk and the ETC. A conf based ETC, uh, my characters were too big or my box is too small to write the word snapshot, but it's a snapshot of this one. A private CFG, one per kill. A private FAR, a private home, and well, whatever other file systems I need for the application. And I can put on more jails. Okay, so far I have built the first server this way with some deficiencies, as I told you, like the missing hook to CFT sync in the uh, second quarter last year. I built two more machines in the third quarter and three more in the fourth quarter, three more in this quarter, and there are another two plans right when I'm back. And this is with uh, three customers, and the two plans are my own machines. Okay, well, uh, thank you a lot of people for helping me out, uh, the people who made all this uh, nice software, the people uh, like my guinea pig Fred Dong who had the first two machines running this way, he also had an extra challenge because he needed uh, the jelly encryption on a machine 200 kilometers from home, he was the inspiration of, uh, for me to uh, to design all this, uh, the guy who helped me with the graphics, especially the looking glass, and uh, well, the guy over there who did a lot of uh, proofreading, and uh, it's nice to talk to him and, and get some feedback. And well, thank you for all of you being here in this room. It's uh, really making a joke out of me if I talk to an empty room and the people who organized the conference uh, for inviting me because I really like to come here. And uh, you'll find some uh, well, stuff everywhere on the internet, uh, the FreeBSD website and some other places. And uh, I'll make sure that this is online somewhere really soon, I hope before I leave Japan or otherwise on, thir uh, on Tuesday when I'm back in the Netherlands. Uh, here you'll find the, the scripts like the CFT sync and the two scripts in the pre-start and the pre-stop hooks and, and other goodies and the last version of my paper. There was one little um, error in my paper, one, uh, you'll see it in the little table, uh, there's the file systems for the prototype zero and the left out slash EDC. So, um, how are we with time? I think two more minutes. I don't know how many questions I have to answer. Please feel free. I did some already. Yep, in the back. We've been using what do you think about it? You are using? Easy jail admin. Easy jail admin. Okay, I have looked at various uh, of these toolkits uh, to administer jails uh, a couple of years ago. Um, in fact, I think some of the inspiration of doing things uh, comes from what I've seen then. At that time, they were not a perfect fit for what I wanted to do. And this has uh, been an evolution over the last couple of years from what I was doing myself. So, um, like I said in the disclaimer in the beginning, this is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, the easy deal uh, tools, I think, serve also a very nice purpose here. Uh, you decided to do one jail, one application, one jail. Is this like on an abstract level, one application set for jail? How strict is this in practice? How many jails do you have on an average? Well, for instance, on a DMZ server, I can have one jail running my DNS server, one jail running all my email stuff. That includes the NTA, but also the, the IMAP server. Uh, one jail for a web server or multiple jails for web servers if I have multiple configurations. Uh, a jail running script. Um, I have an application server with a customer. He's running one jail with um, Samba in it as a file server. He's running one jail with a database application that they've written themselves and another copy of that for development. Um, 
I've got one customer, they want uh, five stages, uh, development, testing, uh, acceptation, uh, production, and a, a backup on another machine. And that means five uh, GILs to run the application in, five GILs for the database, uh, which I wanted to separate from the application, and five GILs for the web front end of the application. Um, is it not a problem? Does the management of all these jails not present a scaling problem? No, in, in contrary. Um, in fact, the amount of management is almost equal to the amount of management if everything were in one geo, but now I can uh, do changes per geo instead of uh, to all applications at once. So every customer is the same? No, all my customers are different. You know, that's not a headache. Um, it used to be a big headache because uh, I'm maintaining, as I said, uh, over 100 servers. Well, um, uh, there is a cluster of machines somewhere, 25 machines that are the same, so that's making it a bit easy. But then there are still some 50 different machines that I have to maintain that are um, uh, installed differently on different sets of applications on different versions of the operating system. And yes, that's giving a headache, and that's why I'm moving towards this scheme to make things easier. I can also very easily make a little wrapper that checks in everything in CFG uh, to a central repository on a nightly basis, and then I have got everything of all the machines centralized. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention, uh, with one of my customers, I have one internal server uh, where they run their applications and another one on the DMZ for uh, all the internet-facing services, but uh, development is not allowed there. So on the application server inside, I've got two different prototypes, one prototype prototyping for the application server itself, and the other prototype geo where I prototype my DMZ server. And I use set of ascent and receive to move over the resulting changes to the DMZ server. And that works very nicely. More questions? Okay, thank you all very much for being so patient and uh, sending me out to the end. And uh, I wish you a very nice uh, continuation of this uh, conference and uh, uh, a lot of nice Japanese food. <laughs>